Good morning. I've just realized that in some ways this talk is possibly a little strange because this is talk is about things that I didn't know. And you know, there's probably a convention in conferences that people who are up on stage at least pretend to know things. I think one of the takeaways from this talk is that the process of being an entrepreneur and running a business or even evolving your career as an individual contributor is a process of getting by without knowing a lot. And being strategic about how you can accept the fact that there is going to be a lot of learning that you're going to have to do continually. So essentially, this is a talk about my personal journey, because it's taken me in a very unexpected, through a very unexpected set of steps. I started out um, as a music academic. I had studied mathematics and computer science at Sydney University. But I found myself with a scholarship to do a PhD in 19th century French piano music and teaching at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. I then went into being a Java developer, gradually got promoted to at least having a chance to undo the work of other people's incompetence, and decided that there was so much incompetence around J2EE at that point in time that I actually needed to write a book about how possibly things could be done better. That, of course, led to Spring and getting involved in open source, and that led to being a co-founder of Interface 21, as it was then, which, of course, became SpringSource. SpringSource, of course, was acquired by VMware in 2009. I stuck around for a couple of years as an executive at VMware, being an executive at a 10,000 person company was an interesting experience that I'm not likely to repeat. And now I find myself essentially back working with startups. So there were some familiar names that I heard in the uh, track listings. For example, Neo Technology. I'm on the board of Neo Technology. In fact, I'm chairman. Um, also, I'm on the board of Elasticsearch, TypeSafe, and a couple of other companies. So the interesting thing to me about this journey is that there is no way on earth that I could have predicted it. I mean, I came from a semi-rural community on the edge of Sydney, Australia. I knew less than zero about the history of the software industry. I knew how to program, and um, I obviously was familiar um, with some of the major software products out there, but I knew nothing about how this industry worked. It's been a fascinating journey, personally, in terms of some very memorable highs and some even more possibly memorable lows. So I remember, for example, being particularly happy at Spring One in 2010. It was the first time, I think, that um, the conference had exceeded 1,000 people, and you know, that, frankly, was a pretty big buzz. I do remember having this strange experience where I realized that every single person staying in the hotel was actually there for the spring conference. So, I mean, it, it had its downsides because there was a certain lack of privacy. I couldn't even get in the elevator without people looking at me and thinking about whether they wanted to talk to me or actually talking to me. But it still was a pretty exciting and rewarding feeling to think that we actually created something that had an impact on a lot of people, and also that a lot of people were excited about it. I think it was about the same uh, conference where I really first reflected on the fact that my co-founders of the company had really become pretty close friends. And you know, there was definitely something about being on this journey that was very satisfying. I think, and I'm sure this is true of um, anyone who's created a successful open source um, project, there's a lot of satisfaction in kind of changing the world, making something a little bit different. I think in our case, it's hard to remember that things like dependency injection and um, POJO programming were controversial and radical and even considered crazy um, 10 years ago. You know, regardless of whether or not um, people use Spring, which obviously an awful lot of people do, 
we did win the battle of ideas in enterprise Java, and that, that, was, that was pretty exciting. And of course, we built a successful business. I think the, for me, the primary reward of that success was not financial. It was in the fact that it had benefited quite a lot of people. So I mean, I, I actually, to be perfectly honest, feel more satisfaction about the fact that I think, you know, our team did well um, out of it collectively than I do about, you know, me personally. And I mean, I, another thing that I think is important about um, the financial side of it is it's a validation. There is an important difference between people using your software and people being willing to pay for something. And it's really nice to actually um, achieve both of them. On the negative side of the ledger, there were some incredibly intense lows. Probably the worst for me personally was struggling to pay our employees in the UK in 2006. Obviously, the founders like um, Jürgen, Colin, and myself went for extended periods of time without being paid. I think Jürgen had the record something like five months without being paid. I didn't go quite so long because uh, I actually had a mortgage, so um, I needed um, money a little more frequently than that. But related to that was the realization I had that partly this was my fault and that there were things, mistakes that I'd made that really you know, were contributing to the company being in a very shaky situation. So that was very, very sobering. So I did a lot of self-examination, thought, am I the right person to be CEO? And seriously considered stepping down and eventually lifted my game and I think learned from that. But it was, it was a pretty, pretty stressful um, period. Another point that I think was definitely the lowest low was when the financial crisis hit, having to lay off people. This one was quite different because it was not at all our fault. I don't think there's anything that we'd done that contributed um, to having to make those difficult decisions. But I mean, really, nothing, nothing feels worse than lying in bed with the flu, as I happened to have at the time, because it was in winter, going through a list of people and knowing that you know, probably 10 to 15% are going to have to be let go. On the one hand, you know that's the right thing, right? It's, if you have the ability to give secure jobs to 105 people or go out of business with 125 people, at one level, it's an easy decision. But it still is about the worst thing you can possibly do in your professional career. I mean, I've fired plenty of people in my career. I'm not overly sentimental about it. I feel almost nothing in firing someone who is not very competent or doesn't work. Um, but when you get to people who are good people and, you know, it just feels absolutely terrible. So that wasn't a whole lot of fun. Fortunately, we turned the ship around um, pretty quickly, and I think we, we handled it in a fairly good way. So you know, we went to extraordinary lengths to try to make this at least as fair as possible. But it was still deeply, deeply horrible. The other thing that was both good and bad, but had a lot of bad in it, was the fact that you do work your butt off constantly. So, you know, for me, it was constant travel. I really did not have any hobbies outside work. My wife still complains that there were at least three years where I literally never talked about anything except work. And I think she's correct. I really had pretty much no interest in anything except work and my children. I think I did make an effort to do things with the children, but besides that, forget it. No television hardly ever going out with friends, um, no hobbies, all gone. And that obviously was also true for my co-founders. So my goals for this talk are that you know a bit more about what it means to do a startup. And if you choose to do it, you make your own mistakes rather than repeat the mistakes I made. There's a great quote from this chap, Bobby Fisher, 
who of course was um, a great chess player about um, 40 or 50 years ago. Um, Bobby Fischer was not renowned for his tact. So there was one um, tournament where he'd just beaten someone fairly easily. And after the game, they were playing over the moves again, which chess players pretty much always do in tournaments. And the opponent was saying, oh, it, you know, if I hadn't made that mistake, it could have been very different. And Bobby Fischer looked at him and said, buddy, if you hadn't made that mistake, you'd have made another mistake. And it's not the most tactful thing to say, but it is true. So, you know, one of the important takeaways right here is if anyone in this room does a startup, you're going to make loads of mistakes. Just try to make it more interesting than repeating some of the mistakes that, you know, I or other people have made. So really, it's not about my journey, it's about your journey. There is an interesting cult of the entrepreneur, which I think is rather overwhelmingly strong at the moment. And to be honest, I'm a little bit cynical about it. There are angels, there are incubators, there are articles on how absolutely awesome it is to be an entrepreneur. You can't get on Twitter without being drowned in this kind of stuff. A lot of it's true. It is an awesome experience. But I think one thing to bear in mind is that it is actually usually a sign of a bubble when people get that excited about both Silicon Valley and the process of being an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. The truth is a little more complex. Being an entrepreneur is probably one of the greatest experiences you can have in your life, but success is highly visible and failure is often invisible. So what we see is very skewed. We see people who very often don't even talk that openly about the things that sucked in their own journey, at least I'm willing to do that. But you know, people who failed often just disappear. So you know, we don't hear about those stories so often. There's also an assumption, I think, that entrepreneurs are necessarily more worthy than other people. You know, I think there have been many great contributions to civilization by people like Albert Einstein who were not at all entrepreneurial. So again, I think this is one of the Silicon Valley bubble things, that the assumption is that unless you're an entrepreneur doing a startup on something, there's no way you can create anything of value. In reality, it's a unique and rather painful lifestyle um, choice. And it has a very high cost. Financial cost, um, you are not going to maintain your lifestyle, period. You're probably doing it wrong if you're maintaining your lifestyle because either you'll be self-funding at first or you'll have small amounts of angel funding or you're paying yourself too much. I don't think that's a good idea because that hurts the entire business. Even after you get, say, venture funding, you are not going to earn what you would earn as a good technologist. If you do, there's something wrong with your approach. So you are going to have a reduced quality of life. You are going to need to um, prepare to abandon all your hobbies, um, go into therapy with your girlfriend, boyfriend, um, wife or kids. And probability is not your friend. The likelihood of failure is very, very high. And you do have to ask the question, how would you cope with that? It's not necessarily disastrous. You might look back on it and think, you know what? It was really worth doing. We tried. I'm proud we tried. It was a great experience. But I think you have to accept that it's partly, it's partly luck. Um, J. Paul Getty, who at the time was the richest man in the world, um, wrote down his formula for success. And it was rise early, work hard, and strike oil there is a considerable element of luck in all this. Okay, so at this point, maybe I haven't scared you off. Maybe you're still interested in doing a startup at some point. Well, here I have some concrete advice. Be methodical. You might have an exciting idea. It's important to pursue that exciting idea in a boring and relatively predictable way. You really want to innovate in technology in a startup you don't necessarily want to innovate on the business side. You may want to innovate on the business side, 
but you also very likely want to make sure that you go through a structured process that may sometimes seem very boring when you're excited about your technology. Firstly, you should identify your problem. You should figure out who you're going to join forces with to tackle this problem, because you're not going to do it on your own. You need to set up a company structure, create and maintain a plan, and choose a funding strategy. Let's walk through this, um, these steps in a little more detail. Step one is the problem. Investors invest in problems more than solutions. Let's imagine that a team um, goes into an investor and the team has some great technology, but it's not clear exactly what problem that solves. That's a big problem in itself. That's a different kind of problem. That's the kind of problem you don't want to have. Let's imagine it's a good team. They've identified a problem for a lot of customers. And their solution may not yet be quite right. It's highly likely they'll be able to work with the solution and get it to the point where it effectively solves the customer's problems. So one of the biggest dangers is falling in love with your technology and forgetting that it's only going to make you money if it solves problems. One of the, this is probably the most important part of the whole thing, because this is where a lot of people go wrong. And there's a few common traps. People fall in love with their idea and they start writing code. I love writing code. In fact, like I think, like many of us, I love writing code so much that it addles my brain. I literally get carried away. I want to solve those technical problems. I want to make it work. And it's very hard for me to step back and think, um, am I actually doing the right thing? So be careful of jumping into a purely technology focus until you've really validated that you have the right problem. How do you validate? Well, firstly, be as skeptical as you can possibly be yourself. And secondly, talk to people. I think it's usually an enormous mistake for people to keep their ideas to themselves. You know, the chances are that um, you're not going to patent your idea, and if you do want to patent your idea, you're evil anyway. Um, so they're really, if you, for example, think that, oh, if I tell people about my idea, they're going to copy it, that tells you something about your idea. Your idea is so trivial that someone else can come along and copy it. That's quite revealing. So in general, seek all the input you can and don't hide from it. So one of the problems that I've seen people um, exhibit is they kind of close up. If anyone says anything critical, they kind of think, oh, he doesn't get it, she doesn't get it. And that's not a good way to be. That, again, tells you something. Another kind of business definition smell, if you like, is being unable to come up with an elevator pitch. Someone asks you, what is your company going to do? And it's like, mm, uh, you know, that is not good. If you can't distill it down, it tells you something. Another useful check with respect to validation that is actually quite obvious, but um, I personally didn't kind of explicitly realize until I learned it from Paul Moritz, who at the time was CEO of VMware, is make sure that you're on the right side of history. So for example, if you are betting, for example, against the continued success of Amazon Web Services, your thesis had better be really good because it seems to have a lot of momentum. If you're betting, for example, against open source, you better have a really good explanation for why that's going to work. So, you know, look and analyze whether or not you are aligned with major historical forces that are likely to contribute to your success. And have a thesis. So don't think, well, we're going to build this and people are going to buy it. Why are they going to buy it? Because it simplifies something? Because it makes them more productive? How does it fit with their needs? So this is where you skip a gear. 
you've done all your questioning. So you stop questioning and you really start executing like crazy. This man was a very fine example of this. He had an unbelievable drive, which people describe in terms of phrases like messianic um, sense of purpose and reality distortion field. So I think you have to start off by willing, being willing to question everything and being quite unsure of whether what you're doing is a good idea. Then you do it 150% until you start doing something else. So at this point, essentially, you're going into battle. And you don't go into battle unsure of yourself. You might review your tactics and your strategy every so often, but you don't do it in a half-hearted fashion. This, I think, is a fascinating balancing act for um, startup founders. On the one hand, they need to have immense certainty. They need to be focused like hell. They need to believe that anything is possible. But on the other side, they have to be willing to question anything and to listen to input that is very challenging for them. So essentially, executed 150% of whatever you've decided to do until you stop doing it. Be willing to stop doing it. When you think about what it is that you want to do, I mentioned the idea of a thesis or you know, some reason that this is likely to be successful. There's another important reason to tie into some kind of historical trend or big picture. And that is what, for want of a better phrase, I refer to as the moral dimension. I don't believe that people are primarily motivated by money, even in startups. People can be motivated by money, but it's kind of limited, right? There is a limit to how good money is ever going to make you feel. It's never going to give you a sense of purpose. It's never going to give you a sense of satisfaction that, you know, I did some little thing that was good in the world. So I think it's very important when you have a bad day um, in a startup to be motivated by things other than money. To know, you know, there is a reason that we're doing this. It's not just to make money. We're doing it, for example, to, in our case, at Spring Source, it was reducing complexity freeing um, the world to the greatest possible extent of WebSphere, um, which was obviously a massive moral good. Um, increasing competition in the market, um, empowering end users. So, you know, the latter two bullets, for example, you can see how Uber, many other um, companies are aligned with those kind of forces. It's very important. It helps your team pull together, and it helps people feel that this is a worthy cause. This is something they can um, feel happy and proud about. The inverse of this, of course, is that you shouldn't do anything that makes you feel at all uneasy. You know, if not only if you're doing something that you don't feel particularly proud of, well, you shouldn't have been doing it in the first place, um, but bear in mind that's probably going to get worse over time if you have a conscience. That at the very least, it's just not going to be very satisfying. I mentioned the um, point that you, know, you will have bad days, and sometimes it's important to be able to motivate yourself on such bad days. I'll give you here a um, free um, piece of motivation you can draw on. If you're doing a startup, you're probably trying to disrupt something and compete with some large companies. Occasionally, you'll get scared and think, oh my god, they could throw you know, any amount of money at this. They could throw any amount of people at this. Absolutely true. Don't feel at all bad about it. Never, under, never overestimate the ability of large companies to execute. Because so often, their apparent strengths are their weaknesses. For example, they can throw any number of people at it they will be guaranteed to throw people at it. Somewhere in that mix will be people who are purely bureaucrats and have no interest in doing anything except preventing their colleagues achieving anything. This is true of every large company I've observed closely. 
that, I mean, possibly the com large company of which it is most true traditionally was Microsoft, where essentially they used to devote much of their time to competing with other groups internally rather than competing in the marketplace. I think it's possible that the Microsoft culture is changing now, but historically, I mean, if you talk to people who were there over the last 15 or 20 years, it's, it's just stunning the level of um, rivalry and nastiness um, between groups. So, you know, this is a great thing for entrepreneurs. Just think that, yes, they will try, but there are many reasons that they will probably mess up. One of which is, of course, the um, fact that they have conflicts between different strategic goals. I mean, you know, Christensen's whole notion of disruption, that I think is very true. Okay, so next step, build your core team. First thing you need to do to build your team is understand yourself. You need predominantly to understand what you suck at. Because if you just hire people who are like you and are good at the same things as you're good at, your company is not acquiring any new competence. That's very, very bad. So, you know, this where I said that in 05, 06, I messed a lot of things up. One of the principal things I learned from that is, okay, I need to get that expertise that I lack. I need to get people like that in-house and I need to learn as much um, as I possibly can from them as well as empower them to do what they need to do. So you really need to build a complementary team around you. And you need to periodically reevaluate how your task has changed, how people are performing, and what new skills you might need to bring in the mix. This is another interesting balancing act because in the same way that entrepreneurs need to be balanced between certainty and, willing to, certainty and willingness to reassess, they need to be balanced between ego and humility. It is frankly not normal to think that you and your colleagues can change the world or you know, completely disrupt some space. That requires a great degree of essentially ego but it needs to be combined with self-awareness or the result will be disaster. So, you know, you need to be very confident about what you're good at. If you are not more confident than the average person, you are not the right person to be pursuing an entrepreneurial path. But you need to look at what you don't know and what you suck at, and you need to make that a key element of building out your team. You also need to look at the alignment within your team. So, for example, do you share the same passion? Do the same things motivate you? Do you share the same aspiration for the company? Does one person want a little lifestyle business? Does someone else want an IPO? That isn't going to work. Um, do you share the same commitment to work? Does someone want to work um, nine to five and have every second Friday off while other people want to work 100-hour weeks? These are the important things that you need to get clear um, and get alignment around. You also need to get alignment around a meaningful culture. The behavior and character of founders is the most important thing that contributes to corporate culture. If you consider, for example, the fact that um, Oracle is a relatively aggressive company, in terms of, you know, for example, the way it sells, the way it approaches competitors. Larry, Oracle has been headed um, by Larry Ellison. Larry is an aggressive kind of guy. It's even when you get to a company of that size, the fundamental driving personalities kind of model and um, show up all the way through. Similarly, with SpringSource, one of the key founders was Jürgen Hurler. Jürgen has a unearthly commitment to code quality. And that, I think, was one of the biggest factors in the fact that we maintained a pretty damn good code base. It wasn't so much that, you know, there were formal policies. It was that people wanted to be like Jürgen. People felt excited that they were going to be held to a very high standard. 
Setting up company structure, this is a little bit um, boring perhaps, but I'll briefly mention it. Don't skimp on advice. Don't do it on the cheap. Design for where you're going rather than where you are now. And there are many things you can get wrong. You really need to pay for professionals around things like you know, company setup. Don't optimize for tax in a software company. Unless you are definitely convinced that this is a lifestyle business and you're just going to you know, run it for cash flow, um, there's highly likely to be some kind of liquidity event in your future and whatever you've done to optimize for tax is gonna be irrelevant to the acquirer and may make it more complex. So generally, tax optimization is a bad idea. Think about where to locate the headquarters. And this is a really interesting point where for certain kinds of business, Silicon Valley has to be seriously considered. I mean, one thing, looking at the startup scene in Sydney, um, where I now spend most of my time, there are quite a lot of entrepreneurs doing things that I think have a pretty low chance of success in Sydney. You're not going to build a social network um, based in Sydney, if the world needs another one anyway. But you know, something like Facebook, for example, is probably not going to come out of anywhere except Silicon Valley. And there are a number of reasons for that. There is the access to funding, there's the um, executive talent that's available. So, you know, there are certain types of business where location is going to be very, very important. Create a plan. This is another one of those things that may seem somewhat boring. And, you know, when people think of plan, they think, oh, God, big document, bureaucracy. Doesn't have to be like that. It can be quite informal, and I don't, I've never seen what I regard as the ideal format, but you must have it, and it must be a living document. So the same as any documentation you do about your software, you need to keep it up to date so that people don't ignore it. I firmly believe that there's magic in writing things down. When you write things down, it's one of those processes like trying to teach something to someone else, where you suddenly realize, hmm, I'm not quite sure I fully understand this. And you can go a long way if you don't try to teach someone something and you don't try to write something down. You can go a long way without noticing that you don't fully understand something or that there are big unanswered questions. So, I mean, I see this now, I'm involved in quite a number of startups, and it is surprising in early stage startups how many haven't adequately written things down. Once you have a plan, you can think about a funding strategy. This depends on the nature of your business and obviously the plan that you just created. So, for example, if you want to run a lifestyle business, that could be a very fine um, thing to do, but don't seek VC funding because you're setting yourself up for conflict. VCs are only interested in hyper growth. Some of the biggest mistakes that I've seen around this are founders are too concerned with dilution. Early on, pretty much all founders, including ourselves at SpringSource, are too concerned about dilution. There is, I think, a fairly widespread belief amongst technical people that investors are evil. Um, and as I said, there's potential misalignment of goals um, between founders and investors. Dilution is generally not a big problem. Dilution is less important than the scale of what you're going to build. So dilution essentially means how much you own of it. Um, what you're going to build means how big the pie is. People get either rich or well-fed by eating from big pies rather than hogging all of a small pie. Uh, so if you fixate on what you need to do to pursue the opportunity fully, you will ultimately find that's you know, a higher order bit than fixating on how much you own of the company. One interesting point about dilution and whether or not investors are evil, every successful entrepreneur I know, even if they have the ability to self-fund, comes back 
and raises venture money when they do a new company. And I think that tells you something about the potential values beyond money of investment. Remember, you probably need more money than you think. Anyone remember Hofstadter's law from Gödel Lesher Bach? It always takes longer than you think, especially if you consider Hofstadter's law. Um, this, is, this is pretty similar. Um, it will always take more money than you think, especially if you consider um, that you need more money than you think. So engineering estimation is ha hard. We totally suck at it as an industry. It's embarrassingly bad. So you know, you think that um, the companies you've worked for are bad at it, you're probably going to be bad at it as well. So imagine if you're three quarters out. That would be bad unless you have enough money. Imagine that you've got to a revenue stage and you have a couple of bad quarters. You want to be able to survive that um, fairly comfortably. Also remember, unfortunately, that spending will go up when you raise money. You should control it to the extent you can, but the fact is people's behavior will change. You will find, for example, that people will start sneaking through things like air on chairs um, unless you have a really good financial controller. Uh, so the world does change a bit, and money goes out the door faster after it's come in the door in the first place. Funding options. First thing to do is educate yourself. There is a wide choice out there. So there are classes of investors such as friends and family, angel, VC, growth equity. There are structures such as plain equity financing, convertible notes. You need to know this stuff and you need to find mentors that you can trust to talk through it with. Also bear in mind that investor location can be very important. European investors are different to US investors, East Coast investors in the US are different to West Coast investors. There is a very big range and you need to understand what you're dealing with. With respect to seeking investment, it's important to understand how the game works. People often make the mistake of thinking that they are only going to need to raise one round of financing. Very, very seldom true. So, the first round of financing you raise is not going to be the last and it's not going to get you to an IPO or other liquidity event. What it is going to do is get you to some other place. And at that other place, hopefully it's a good place to raise more money. So essentially you raise money in order to raise money again. And the valuation of companies tends to fluctuate over time because investors aren't very rational. So you really want to raise on a promise. Great example of this is launching a new product. Sometimes companies, when they're just about to launch a new product, get a higher valuation than when they've launched the new product and it's successful. Because at that point, people are starting to do math and thinking, hmm, this is really good. They're going to sell n units of this and now we can work out what the margin is on this and what the gross is. And they come up with real numbers. You never want that when you're seeking investment. You want to sell hope. You don't want to sell anything based on real numbers. This is how the entire technology industry works. Um, fundamentals is not where it's at. Um, I know it sounds very cynical, but there is a lot of truth in it. So you need to choose to be valued on promise as much as possible. And I mean, obviously, as you go on, you have to build a real business. It's not like you can get away with promise um, forever. Um, but there are still always going to be fluctuations in your valuation. And when you're selling as much hope as possible, um, with as little emphasis as possible on numbers, that's going to be a great place to be. You will be married to your investors, so choose wisely. You cannot ever get rid of them once. So for example, if you have any conflict with an investor going into it, don't, don't sign the contract. This is going to be a problem. You know, people are very nice to each other before they get married. Um, at afterwards, 
you kind of see, um, uh, there's a fuller and franker exchange. But on the flip side, the value of a good investor can be immense. If I look, for example, at what was contributed to SpringSource by Peter Fenton and Kevin Efrazy, our two lead investors, I learned so much from those guys. Very smart people, they see a lot. There's a lot of pattern recognition, good people to kind of strategize on problems with. So bear in mind the value of that expertise as well, because it's far more than just money. You can afford to get a lot of things wrong. So it's quite remarkable and surprising, actually, how many things you can get wrong um, and if you're prepared to make a course correction. But just bear in mind that making course corrections can be difficult because you've got, if you're going in a different direction, you've got to persuade all the people that you had really excited about the last direction that they should do something else. There are a couple of classes of mistakes that you really should avoid, and I think they're principally people mistakes and legal mistakes. If you really want to blow up your company spectacularly, combine the two. So, for example, get disputes amongst founders, disputes with employees. You really can mess things up much faster with people um, than with respect to technology. You can rewrite technology, you can't rewrite people. Legal details matter. This gentleman on the right is um, Ronald Wayne, who's sometimes referred to as the third founder of Apple. Ronald sold 10% of his Apple stock in the late 70s for $2,300 because he was concerned about a legal risk. He was concerned, essentially, that he was partnered um, in an LLC with two guys called Steve, and he thought they were both crazy, and he was worried that he would be liable for debts they would incur. Of course, he was right that they were both crazy, um, but <laughs> he could have used a corporate structure where he captured the upside without the downside, and it would have been called a limited company. So, you know, a little bit more sophistication, willingness to, you know, pay a bit more to set it up properly, as I said. Obviously, he could have had a very different lifestyle today. He lives in a very modest house in um, Parump, Nevada. Um, which I've been to, it's not an exciting town, and he sells stamps from his home. Prior to SpringSource, one of our founders failed to gain $1 million in options because a legal agreement at that company had been screwed up. If he'd been a US citizen, he would have got $1 million. He was Canadian, he didn't get it. So, you know, these things can really matter. Okay, a few lessons from SpringSource now, more specifically about our experience. We got some big things right. The technology and vision remained true and obviously resonated with the market. So we were very clear on what our elevator pitch was. It was simplifying enterprise Java, and we stuck with that as our strategy evolved. We also did very well on the team dynamic side. We had a very stable team, uh, hardly anyone left, um, particularly from the engineering side. Everyone was highly committed, and you know, of course there's conflicts in, within any group of people, but fundamentally people liked and respected each other. And yeah, we functioned pretty well as a team. We got quite a lot of um, other details right as well. One of possibly the most important was maintaining product quality. As I mentioned, Jürgen was a huge factor in that. Jürgen created a culture and led by example, which caused other people to probably write better code than they'd ever written before and feel you know, just great about themselves as engineers. We did very well in raising money. We not only got a good valuation in each round, as I mentioned, we got some fantastic investors, and that really contributed a lot to our success. And I think we did do a good job of realizing where we sucked and bringing in people who didn't suck in the same ways. So, for example, we brought in a lot of expertise in sales and marketing and finance that enabled us to do things in the business that we could never have done purely within the founding team. This is a very important point. You need to expand the gene pool of your company. So one of the companies I've involved in, I'm involved in now, 
is largely composed of exceptionally bright people who went to MIT. And they're great. And fairly early on, one of the first questions I asked was, can you please hire someone who didn't go to MIT? Um, because you really, at some point, need to hire people who have different experience, different strengths and weaknesses. If you keep um, hiring people who are the same as you, you are going to end up as a company very distorted, really good in some things and really bad in others. I mean, it's, a, it's exactly the same as, you know, diversity is a general issue. Diversity is a wonderful thing because if you have people who think different, you are creating a company that's more resilient. So, you know, if you find yourself in a particularly challenging situation, it's likely somebody might have the answer. But if everybody's the same kind of person, it's quite likely they won't have the answer. We made a lot of mistakes. In the early years, we thought far too little about the business. We knew our technology was great. We were really excited. We wrote loads and loads of code. And we built what we were excited about rather than what customers would pay for. I think we did a good job in the open source community. But I'm talking here more about you know, our first attempts to build commercial products. We decided, for example, we got very excited about DM Server. We built a product that essentially had a tiny niche because we were in love with the technology and then needed to try to convince customers that they had a problem. It's not the way to do it. Remember, the problem comes first. If you ever find yourself having to struggle to convince customers that they have a particular problem, you should do something else because that's a really bad warning sign. In the early years, we didn't always have a business plan and we didn't have financial projections. My points about setting up company structure cleanly come from personal experience. We spent, I think, about $200,000 cleaning up the things we messed up with respect to our company structure. And one of the reasons for that was that we were geographically dispersed. We just had no idea how difficult it is to have founders on multiple continents and customers almost all over the world. We also were unfamiliar with, you know, Silicon Valley conventions, so we didn't put in an option pool before Series A. We had inconsistencies in contracts. We fixed all those things, but it was a painful and wasteful process to have to do it. Why did we make these mistakes? Predominantly inexperience. Um, the second bullet is a mistake. I'm not sure what I meant there. Um, but I think the biggest factor was that we were excited over our technology. We just got up in the morning and thought, whoa, this is great. We're having such a great time writing code that we didn't actually focus sufficiently on the business. Geographical distribution was another massive factor, and this is something that's particularly relevant in open source. Open source companies bring together even founders from different geos. That produces some really interesting um, challenges. Also, lack of a good mentor. I mean, an example of the strengths and weaknesses, I mean, looking back, I knew absolutely nothing about how Silicon Valley worked. I knew nothing about building a business plan. I knew very little about management, and I knew very little about how you create and maintain and evolve business models. I knew how to write Java code, and I was, had some consulting experience and could communicate. But you know, the negatives were pretty damn massive, and I didn't realize that at first. How I could have solved that would have been getting a good um, mentor. This is one of my favorite far side um, cartoons where the cow guru is um, wearing the sash and the um, calf is sitting at his feet and the cow guru is saying, as you travel life's highway, don't forget to stop and to eat the roses. So I really needed a guru who was going to tell me essentially what things um, not to mess up partly based on experience. So, you know, one of the best things you can do early on is obtain one or more really good mentors, people you can trust. We didn't make some truly destructive mistakes. We didn't have disputes between our founders. I think we did a good job at maintaining the trust and respect of our user community and customers. 
And I think that was because we kept our core values in mind. You know, we didn't sell out. And we did maintain discipline in terms of, you know, letting, ensuring that the burn rate never became excessive, that, you know, we, we um, ran the business in a sound way. We also were careful not to let big customers take control of our roadmap. This is incredibly destructive to small companies. Wall Street banks are generally the best at this. Um, what they will say is, hmm, oh, yes, really like that. Um, like how it does X. If it did Y, that'd be great. We'd buy it if we do, it did Y. So you build Y. You go back and they say, hmm, that's really good. You know, if it did Z, we'd definitely buy it if it did Z as well as X and Y. And this is a game that, I mean, these people do with a degree of premeditation, and it can destroy small companies. So we didn't fall for that one. We also avoided the mistake of being nasty people and running a nasty company. I think, I, maybe this belief is a bit naive, but I believe that karma really matters in business. It really matters if you behave in a way that you know, people feel comfortable with you. It really matters that you're always seen to be ethical. It really matters that you're as nice as you can reasonably be because everything does come around. And I'm not saying that you need to be a wimp. You, I mean, you can compete with other companies um, fiercely um, without being unethical or needlessly pissing people off. So, you know, I'm certainly not advocating being mild-mannered to the point of, you know, not trying to crush all your competitors. I'm personally obsessed from that, with that, as any of my co-founders would tell you. Um, but you can do it in a relatively nice way. Let me give you a couple of examples of this um, through my career. The first is um, one other prominent company in the enterprise Java space tried to recruit me in 2004. That discussion did not go well. It was a 20-minute discussion. The first 19 minutes were kind of unsolicited recruiting. And when I very politely said no, there followed one minute of threats, where this person said, if you keep telling lies, there are going to be consequences. And it was like a broken record. So I said, I don't think I'm telling lies. Um, and he said, if you keep telling lies, there will be consequences. And he looked at me. I swear a red light came into his eyes. It was, <laughs> it was almost scary. And so eventually I couldn't. I thought I was going to break out laughing. So I looked down at this guy and said, what are you going to do, hit me? He's, he's not a very large individual. It's just, <laughs> but you know, I think the central point here is that there was absolutely no reason that even if we competed with that organization, there was no reason that it needed to be personal. And afterwards, I must admit, that you know, every so often I would get up and my motivation for the day was, we're going to beat those guys. Um, so bear in mind that not only is it going to be a challenge in terms of your ability to work with people later if you piss them off, but if you piss them off, you're actually motivating them um, to compete with you more vigorously. Another rather similar um, example was a bit later. It was the first acquisition offer we had in 2007. It was actually a pretty fair offer. Um, and we considered it, and we politely declined. The um, EVP who'd been driving this offer was incredibly nice about it, um, and that was all fun. But there was a Corp Dev VP on the call who really was quite angry that apparently this, you know, this little company wouldn't comply with his wishes. And so he signed off. Um, on the call saying, so you want to roll the dice. And I wasn't that bothered about it, but um, one of my co-founders was absolutely incensed about it. And it's just not smart. You don't need to do that. You don't need to give people extra motivation. And I mean, I must say that, you know, I think we ended up costing that company hundreds and hundreds of millions in revenue. And it kind of made me feel good that we not only rolled the dice, but it didn't actually work out the way they wanted it to work out. So you don't need to do things like that. 
Another positive example of the right way to do it. One of the investors that we um, turned down at Spring Source in favor of Benchmark, I am working with now. I actually got this investor involved in the company and he is making a fantastic contribution. And there was no ill will. I mean, I was very open with him about why we made the decision that we did, that we felt the right thing was to move the company's headquarters to the Bay Area. And, you know, I actually obviously gave him a response he didn't want to hear, but I did it in a way that preserved a personal um, relationship. And not only does that feel good, it's actually very important in the long run. So, since Spring Source, I've been involved in quite a number of other startups, which has given me you know, a different perspective. Many of them are represented here. So I think I'm out of time now, so I can't really say anything about the more recent lessons I've learned. But you know, it's been a mixture of learning new things and seeing over and over again some of the importance of those fundamentals. So you know, I hope that one of the things that you would take away from this is that discipline is important. A lot of it may sound obvious. A lot of it is obvious. Maybe it's too obvious because people often forget these simple steps. Remember that doing a startup is risky and is not. There's going to be a crazy roller coaster ride and um, may not make you happy. Focus on the problem before the solution. Remember, just about everything's about people, not technology. Always maintain a written strategy and plan. I think there are lessons here, even if you're not interested in doing a startup. There is no longer any such thing as a secure job. Every one of us is an entrepreneur in our own career. So a lot of those ideas around competitive advantage, building networks, maintaining relationships, actually having a plan for where you're going to invest, that applies to even individual employees. So the ways you can get ahead are very similar in terms of profiting um, from disruption. Also, I think it's a very important skill for developers to be able to assess the prospects of startups. You may find yourself um, considering a job at a startup. Think about some of the things I've said. Do they seem to have a good plan? Have they got a good elevator pitch? Do they have a funding strategy that's coherent? Um, a lot of the, is their founding team a cohesive team? Are they all the same kind of people or have they brought in different skills? Those kind of questions are very important in making that assessment. And finally, one of the really exciting things, both from an entrepreneurial perspective and from a personal perspective, is that in today's world, an individual developer can make an immense impact. So either as an individual or you know, in a startup with um, a bunch of co-founders, the impact that you can personally make is radically different from the impact that, say, a software developer could make 25 years ago. So whichever way you go about pursuing um, your work and career, I think this is probably the most exciting time in history to be a developer. So we don't really have time, but this is a very quick yes and no question that came in. So do you think it's a good idea to do a startup with a friend? Because personal relationships seems to always make it difficult to take professional and rational decisions. Hmm, that's a really, really interesting question. And I mean, I've seen, I've seen this work and I've seen it um, not work. So there, I think doing a startup with a friend makes sense if you've done a startup with them before. So for example, with someone you've worked with before, maybe before you were friends, and you're now friends, yes, I think it's safe to do another business with them because you know how they um, are under pressure. I think you just need to be completely explicit and completely honest. So for example, one of my um, companies, Meteor, the two founders are very close friends. They've been you know, either at college together or working together for most of the last 15 years. They hang out a lot socially. They, I think, have an amazingly good grasp at what each of them is good and bad at, and they can 
correctly separate those relationships. I mean, I think you absolutely need to discuss it. It's, you know, it's something you need to be very upfront about. For example, you need to be sure that if it doesn't work out, that it isn't going to destroy the friendship. Thank <laughs> you.